Welcome back, beautiful people. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Up next in our business and buzz segment, we have Kyle Wool. He's president of wealth management at Revere Securities, joined by his good friend, Vuk Jeremik, who's president of the Center for International Relations and Sustainable Development, which is a global public policy think tank. And he's also editor in chief of the quarterly magazine Horizons, Journal of Internal Relations and Sustainable Development. Now, Vuk served as Serbia's Minister of Foreign Affairs from 2007 to 2012. Quite impressive. They're going to be joining us in just a few to chat about the rising global inflation and how it affects our economy and the political climate. Now, Americans are likely to face higher prices on everything from gasoline to groceries well into next year, threatening to turn a simmering economic issue into a major political one. The rapid reopening of the economy this summer led to massive price hikes for travel services, used cars, and other goods that were initially dismissed as fleeting phenomena. But the inflation spike now appears to be on track to persist deep into 2022, when midterm elections will determine who controls Congress as clogged supply chains, labor shortages, and Unabated consumer demand push costs even higher. We're going to see how that plays out. And this rising inflation is triggering anxiety around the world as a surge in demand following the easing of COVID-19 lockdowns has been confronted by supply bottlenecks and rising prices of energy and raw material. It's craziness across the board. The sharpest consumer price increases in many countries have evoked different responses from central banks. More than a dozen have raised interest rates, but the two that haven't are those that loom largest over the global economy, the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank. Their differing responses reflect differences in views about whether the pickup in prices will feed further cycles of inflation or will instead fizzle out. For one... This is for certain. Whichever view is right will do much to shape the trajectory of the global economy over the next few years. But I am no expert. Let's figure it all out together with Kyle and Vuk Jeremik. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Hello. Kyle, welcome back. Vuk, pleasure to have you today. And I'm going to dive right in. Kyle, I'm going to start with you. Prices, uh, price rises began to accelerate worldwide back in March, taking inflation rates higher than most central bankers had ever expected. By August, the annual rate of inflation in the group of 20 largest economies, which accounts for about four-fifths of the world's output, had risen to a decade high. And everywhere else, governments are resorting to measures that were common during the 1970s, but have since been set aside in most countries. On Wednesday, case in point, Argentina's Interior Commerce Secretary, Roberto Filetti, announced a 90-day price freeze on approximately 1,300 goods in stores amid concerns about rising food prices. Craziness around the globe, Kyle. Clearly, Joe Biden and his camp are not the most seasoned business savviest of our administrations that half of America banked on. Where have they gone wrong here, or haven't they? Well, ever since the COVID-19 crisis, I think at the end of the day, we have to really look at the fiscal policy. We're continuing to print money. We're continuing to give people money to stay at home. And we're continuing not to force people back into the labor force, which is very problematic. When you continue to add more money into the money supply, you create inflation. It's basically economics 101. What we need to do is we need to have some serious tough conversations with ourselves and say, do we really need a $3.5 trillion <clears throat> excuse me, spending plan on top of all the capital that we've already put in? Or do we need to think about more prudent ways to spend our money and have the Fed to begin to start to taper, let alone end this monetary policy that we've had really since the beginning of COVID of just printing money and continuing to add money into the supply? I agree. I mean, the definition of insanity is doing something over and over again and expecting different results. And this feels quite insane. Um, Vuk, we all know that inflation is the mother of big political change. I remember, uh, I don't remember, but I remember reading that the great inflations of the 1970s uh, were 
quite the headliner. Um, neither Democrats or Republicans could sit out the demand for reform back then, and the inflationary crisis imploded a large government establishment occupied with trying to fix the supply and price of air travel, uh, track, uh, uh, truck transport, rail services, and consumer energy supplies. It basically imploded a tax system that was found to be constantly promoting people into higher brackets, even as they're actual income and living standards declined and in all quite a revolution in government's role in the economy began under jimmy carter and continued under ronald reagan and 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 was echoed basically around the western world is this a repeat of that era because it kind of feels like so well uh you know my background is really uh foreign affairs as a former president of the united nations general assembly um, I spend more time looking at geopolitics than economy. But one thing that is in common to geopolitics and the economy is that both come in cycles. In economy, they're easier to spot, they're easier to quantify, and they tend to last shorter. Uh, but just like in economy, in geopolitics, there are cycles. There are cycles of boom and there are cycles of bust. But in geopolitics, they tend to last longer. Well, right now we are in a geopolitical recession around the world. And uh, I'm afraid that this geopolitical recession is with us to stay for a while. Uh, we're basically uh, diving deep into a Cold War, into a new Cold War, this time between the United States and China. But unlike the previous Cold War, to which you referred to, because this time, 70s uh, was during the first Cold War, the two leading actors in the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the United States, did not have intertwined economies. But this time around, uh, there is a deep intertwining between not just the US and Chinese economy, but the global economy. So the fact that uh, we seem to observe deterioration of diplomatic relations around the world, and in particular between the United States and China, that gives one um, cause for a pause in reflection on how is that going to affect, for instance, the U.S. market. Exactly. I mean, I, I think it's all intertwined. And the bigger picture here is that it's a cause and effect. It's a ripple effect and everything kind of breeds right out of here, the United States of America. I mean, Kyle, listen, for the past several months, the conventional wisdom has been that recent price spikes were a function of pandemic related supply chain disruptions that should soon be resolved. Right. So everything comes down to what that soon turns out to mean. Where do you see us headed under the current circumstances and how does one turn this ship around, in your opinion? Well, I think for the supply chain, that's a conversation on its own. And, we, and I've been talking about this for the last few months on a moment of Zen for our, our weekly and monthly listeners, is we've had major disruption in the Taiwan and South Korean chip market. And the chip market is not what it was 10, 15, 20 years ago when it was all about Dell computers and Apple computers or even 10 years ago when it was about iPads and iPhones. The chip market is much more diversified now. It goes into every single car. I don't know if you have a Tesla or BMW or Mercedes or Ford or GM. Every one of these cars has a multitude of chips in it. So when you're talking about the supply chain, it is highly intertwined between ourselves, East Asia, and also how that does affect China. Because let's face it, even Taiwan Semiconductor, they still have plants in mainland China. So whether it's the like what Vuk just mentioned, the 1970s, the Soviet Union, or our intertwined Cold War right now with the supply chain disruptions, but with also China not letting a lot of these Chinese companies access the US capital markets. The answer is then, I don't quite have the answer for you, but I do think we need to stop spending money like, like we can print it more than we have every single month. I think that's a big issue. And I think if we can get a little more fiscally responsible, I think that'll begin to help the problem. Yeah, I totally agree. And I just feel like under the current administration, uh, we were a far, a far cry from that. I mean, uh, Vuk, until we get there, and this might not be your per se area of expertise, but globally, I mean, politicians and especially the Democrats who control the White House on both houses of Congress will need to adjust to this to, to the precarious politics of an inflationary economy. Well, that's a fact. It's been a long time since anyone has needed to do that. And an, inflation, an inflationary economy could well favor the Republicans here who have been historically 
historically more comfortable with emphasizing supply side issues. Now, inflation has become a problem for the first time, like I said, since the Carter administration. High, infl okay, high inflation continued into the first year or so of the Reagan era, but then it ended and hasn't been a real major economic factor since. How is this basically, you know, the rest of the world is currently being affected by our current administrations, uh, either over inflating here or mishandling of the economy. How does that affect our position of power within the rest of the world, in your opinion? Well, in general, what is currently politically going on in the United States is very, very closely watched by everybody else. And um, I am not sure if uh, after the next year elections, uh, we're going to have the same majorities um, on the Hill, the ones that we have right now. But as we approach the next year's election, I think uh, that uh, it'll make, unfortunately, in my opinion, for a fruitful politics, for a good politics, to, to sharpen the stance globally, and in particular with regards to China. And there will be consequences. And uh, to what Kyle said with regard to the supply chains, and in particular the supply chains in East Asia, I think are going to suffer. And then I think that uh, the U.S. companies uh, will have to make their stance on where the situation is going, not just with regard to pure market parameters, like uh, I don't know what is going to be the debt and uh, inflation and all that, but basically whether or not those companies, and some of which are very, very powerful, some of which are so powerful that uh, they're being compared to the state, and especially, especially the, uh, the big tech companies, they'll have to make their choice as to whether or not they're going to totally diversify or, uh, or they're going, oh, sorry, to decouple. Are they going to decouple from uh, the risky territory and in particular China? There are right now about 10% of companies in America that uh, they don't have a business case in China. They can't do business there because of regulation. It's, uh, it's related to national security. They were basically abandoning the market. But about 90% of the companies for the time being, they're either uh, standing still, staying put, seeing what is going to happen, just observing what's happening. And there are some of them which are currently expanding their uh, operations in China because China is like too big uh, a market for them to abandon. So if this stays the case, then I expect that there'll be political pressure uh, from the big companies on the American government not to uh, be so hawkish uh, the way it is uh, right now. You know, it's it's an, it's amazing that you're tying it all together because it almost feels like a game of chess. You know, I almost feel like we've put ourselves in this position. We've elected officials, um, you know, in my opinion, that could, could be doing a much better job um, on the foreign policy side and even on, on, on the economic side. But I almost feel like this game of cat and mouse um, is going to end poorly unless the, like you said, unless the, they turn the ship around rather quickly and, and start to really kind of look at the ripple effect and the cause and effect, because you have a population right now that's just out there spending, spending, spending with no end in sight, where there's a lot of money available. And yet, you know, the higher the rise, the greater the fall. At some point, it's going to even out and we're all going to feel the pressure. Kyle, we have about a minute and a half left. Um, on the investment side at Revere Securities, you're president of wealth management. How has this affected overall business? Has this, would you say, from the big tech and big farm, has this you know, increased their, their appetite for investment or are they holding back? Well, let's really <clears throat> dive down into what people are talking about right now in the markets. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's really investments are doing well. You have large cap tech heading higher. Tesla just broke a trillion dollar market cap yesterday. But the real smart money is looking at the fixed income market. And that's where the inflation is coming in. You're seeing the 10-year move up every single day. You're seeing the yields come down every single day. The 10-year is the biggest indicator of inflation in the marketplace. At some point, you're going to have a reckoning between the S&P 500's returns and what's going to happen with the 10-year. So as the 10-year continue to move higher and yields continue, I mean, as yields continue to move higher and price continues to go lower, we're going to have to really take a hard look at the risk to reward ratio compared to some of these investments. Because if we go back to 2005, 2006, and you're getting 5 or 6% on your money, it's a much different scenario than the last three years when you're getting 
zero on your money in the bank. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you make so much sense. Totally. Well, listen, guys, it's been a pleasure talking with you. We ran through our uh, 14 minutes rather quickly because this has been a great conversation. Vuk, thank you so much for taking the time to to pipe in uh, this morning here on the East Coast. And we're going to be airing uh, later on today at 9 p.m. But thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Zan. Thank you, Bye. both. Bye. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. You're listening to a moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. That was Kyle Wool, president of wealth management at Revere Securities, and Vuk Jeremic, president of the Center for International Relations and Sustainable Development, which is a global pub public policy think tank. And he's also the editor in chief of Corden Magazine Horizons. You're listening to Zen Sam's right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. We'll be right back after this. The options and recommendations expressed by Kyle Wool are his and his alone and may not represent Revere Securities as a whole. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Revere Securities. Revere is committed to building a relationship of trust in which they work closely with you to help you define your objectives, explore alternatives, and choose the financial and investment strategies that are most appropriate for you. Go to reveresecurities.com.